Very happy to welcome to the Luck on Sunday studio for the first time, I think, but hopefully not the last, a man who enjoyed his career highlight yesterday with a horse who has been a great servant and may not be done improving yet because he is still young. I dare say similar comments apply to his trainer. The horse's song for someone, the trainer, is Tom Simmons, who joins me now. Tom, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, it's not exactly down the road for you, this, is it? No, it was quite an early call this morning, but... Um... Uh, mother driving me still um, in life, looking after me, uh, helped us get here on time. This is this is fantastic. You have been supervising a string now of horses for what eight seasons? Are you eight? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, uh, I, believe, yeah. I yeah. don't count, but something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you are a, a married man. You're a family man, but mum is still very much there absolutely. at your side. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I always say she, you know, they live up the road, which is close enough to feed us, not too near to annoy us, that kind of thing. But yeah, very, it's very much a family-orientated thing. And is that where the interest in the whole game came from in the first place? Yes, I, um, I remember when I was uh, just starting out, I had a pony that was lame. And I used to, on occasions, ride out um, point to point as for Lady Nikki Sharp, uh, Evans as she is now. And then we moved away from Hay on Wye, where I grew up, and then moved to just outside Ross and Y, which happened to be very near another lady trainer called Venetia Williams. And um, this pony I had went lame and Shirley Vickery um, said to me, why don't you just come and ride racehorses and then your mother hasn't got to look after your horses or ponies when you're away at school. So I did. And that is where I really got the bug. So that was your first experience of thoroughbreds was with Venetia? Uh, yeah, like, you know, it was, I, I always think throughout, my life so far, I've been truly spoiled in terms of being around at a time when Venetia had Tita Mill and Lady Rebecca in the Outback Way and all these horses that, when I was at school, totally and utterly captured it. Well, they, my imagination was completely daunted by being around them, you know, and then being able to follow them at school and tell all the monks what was going to win. Uh, because you were at? Worth Abbey in Sussex, yeah. So, which is a, a Catholic school mm. run by monks. Given that, how did the monks enjoy your interest in horse racing? We've been speaking quite a bit on this programme about the, uh, the way that libertarianism and Puritan, Puritanism rub, rub, rub against one another. How was it being a, a massive racing and presumably a bit of a betting fan at a, at a um, Catholic school? <laughs> Interesting. I used to have to often go to the uh, network provider and going, look, I'm not a gambler, but can you, because they obviously stopped children going on gambling sites, which the racing post then, which was non, you didn't have to pay to get in and you could read everything, get all the stats. But it was purely just born out of awe of watching Venetia just place horses like no one, other, no one else does and win these races just shelling peas, you know, like Samarkand, horses like that, and Nordance Prince, who I thought was a most tremendous horse. And uh, my housemaster backed him every single time he won. Uh, and so it was, it was just one of those things that distracted me in a good way from school, because I did actually finish school. So it was uh, just something to keep me going, really. So the monks were punting like mad. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but I, I think that it's quite a good... They like to bet. Yeah, well, masoch it's, it's quite a masochistic thing, you know, being, you know, that if something goes wrong in life, you know, the Catholic way is, you know, a bit of persecution makes you stronger. So, you know, years of trying to get horses to win, and if they don't, or, you know, like yesterday was a, such a fabulous day, and people kind of go, it's taken a while for us to do what we're doing now. But, you know, it, it kind of grinds, grinds you to do better. You know, when things don't go your way, you want to get better. You know, that's a real yeah. Catholic thing, I think. Inspires you to mm. to keep to keep moving forward. Yeah. So Venetia, as you said, was having this 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 purple patch. Where 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 did the journey take you after Venetia? Did you did you go through through school and and go on to further education, or was it was it straight into horses? Um, I didn't actually. My tutor, we were sitting down one day, and he said, "Do we need to do UCAS?" And I was like, "Oh." Never thought of that. So I was actually one of the people, the only people in my year that didn't do UCAS. I did University of Life, as he called it. He goes, just go and shovel horse poo. And I was like, okay. So I did. And I went to work for Michael Scudamore and Peter, Michael Senior, um, uh, who is who's tremendous. And it was, you know, all hours work, you know, really having to get up early, muck out, ride out, muck out, and just, you know, really get involved. And uh, Maz was always one of those people that's like, you know, you have to work hard, but then we play very hard, and we always did. And I loved it. And then uh, I went to um, buy a, <clears throat> uh, Janet Anderson went down to James Fanshaw's for three months and stayed nearly three years, because I, again, was there, arrived. And it's not, I'm not saying I was the reason, but I was just lucky enough to be there when a certain Mayor Soviet song was there. We had Saw. Frizzante, Zidane, you know, Revier, all these, and we had all La Loire as well, who was in the sort of twilight years, but still there, a tremendous horse. Uh, so, 
I was just, you know, spoilt as ever. What was it like to work for James Fanshawe? Great fun, loved it, and it's a real, uh, you know, the yard is beautiful, and the way he is with his horses and, you know, the owner breeders he has, it's just that, that totally and utterly got me ticking, you know, I love the breeding and the families of all the horses, and he knows them, you know, uh, you see, you know, now with the Tin Man, you know, that family, he's, had, he's known that for years, um, and uh, obviously, I, you know, Bold Gate was still there when I was there, and he, you know, he won a Northumberland plate under top weight from that great Royal Gate family that James also obviously was involved in. Mind-boggling. I loved it. Uh, I, you know, these two. We had, you know, Saw was champion two-year-old or joint champion two-year-old, and you, you just, I, I, it was just like, you know, I, I was always lost for words of what happened. You know, we had Royal Ascot winners just came, and then we had festival winners and at Cheltenham, and uh, unbelievable. Uh, you have an incredible uh, memory for for racing facts, figures, statistics. Would you say that you're a bit of a, a basically a racing nerd? Yeah, I mean, I think. Racing fan, you know, w w w that's what we all are, aren't we? I mean, I'm happy to call myself a racing nerd. I'm, I, I don't, I don't use it pejoratively at all. I take quite, quite a lot of pride in it. Would you go for sort of more anorak or geek, maybe? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to be that. Yeah. Um, I like following patterns uh, and seeing uh, how things. You know, I, I will often look at horses that have for other, other people and think, how did they do that? How did they place the horse to do that? Which is, well, as I say, like Venetia did. Um, and uh, you know, I've been watching with great. Uh, I, lo I love the ma uh, main main fact of David Pipes. I mean, how he's managed I, to win. I, I, yeah, that kind of makes me tick. I'm like, wow, how amazing is that horse? Um, so yeah, I am. I, but I am a fan, and that's why yesterday, referring to it, is you know we want to compete, um, and it's about competing and sport. Being sporting is what it's all about. So. You know, it was a tremendous day for us, but not so much for uh, the Moors. But I just, I just hope he's okay. But you know, it, it was sad that that didn't come to pass. That, but we competed with something else in uh, Silver Streak. So, um, but that's what it, you know. Like I, I was just talking outside there about the Gold Cup, the long run one. You know, watching three horses like that come over the last. It, you just that those are things you can't buy. You know, that having Gold Cup winners upsides at the last that day was incredible. Yeah, you have, you have a, a real depth of appreciation for the sport. It's not just, a, I know you love training winners, mm. I know you're very ambitious, but it's, it feels like, to me, talking to you, that it's, it's something a bit more immersive. It's kind of a total immersion in the, in the game. It's not just seeing your name at number 32 or 27 or 43 or 2 in the Trainers' Championship. No, I think by my nature, as my teachers will ask you, or anyone who's ever been around me as a child, I'm quite a quizzical person. I ask a lot of questions, um, and my son definitely seems to have inherited that. Uh, I, I want to know horses inside and out. You know, I want to make sure we don't leave any stone unturned if we um, are not getting there with a the horse. I, I had one filly when we first started, Tweedle Drum, who I, it was like a Rubik's Cube, and I couldn't. I was like, why can I not understand this horse? You know, she was sound, she used to jump well ate well, looked well, trained well, but just wasn't ever hitting that note we were needing. Um, and she was by a very good stallion as well and from a good family of um, the King's Clear Thoroughbreds. And Rolt, to cut the long story short, we ran her at Bangor one day and Ben Post was instrumental in her sudden research, well, not even resurgence, her sort of upgrade. And um, he said, just do this. And so we took her to Ascot one day because one of the owners wasn't very well. Um, and I'm not one of those people who just goes, let's get swan off to Ascot. But it was a mare's handicap hurdle, of which she was out of the handicap, which I didn't enjoy much. She had a big white face, and it was that wet that I walked away and thought, that, that horse has done it again, let us down. And they went, the winner is number 16, you know, and she'd won that day. And then she suddenly just got the gig and then won at Kempton. And then she won a listed race, you know, and so that is the kind of thing I'm like, that worked. And actually she ended up being third, beaten a long way in the, in the long walk, actually. What did you do? Just listen to what Ben said, you know, because we didn't do much, much different, you know, we didn't change her routine much at home. But it was just finding that, clicking that way of riding her and, and just understanding what ground she really needed and how she had to be asked, not told, like a lot of... Um, the fairer sex um, of, of horses, you know, they just need to be given time and she definitely needed that and then suddenly she was our first ever runner and so it was this big sort of, you know, big day, ex-assistant of Nicky Henderson's first runner and she pulled up, so it was great, but she repaid us in spades because we got it right. The colours started to match a little bit, so it was very satisfying for a very good group of owners as well. 
This journey is, is something that's that's quite interesting because when you were assistant trainer to, to Nicky Henderson, um, I, mean, I won't spare your blushes, it was widely considered in the industry that you were the best assistant he'd had and you were going to make an immediate impact as a trainer and you were going to train 100 winners in your first season and you were going to smash every record. And it hasn't quite happened like that. Did you feel a lot of pressure going out on your own because of the expectations on you? Uh, not really. I remember I took, I started off with James Nixon and I, who were at Nicky's, and he came with me to Herefordshire. And at Nicky's, you, your horses would arrive and you'd be, you know, what could this win at Cheltenham? And then you go to start on your own. It's like, what could this actually do? Can it, can it win anything? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, again, it's just being that truly spoiled person. I've been so lucky to be involved in so many horses and I don't feel it, I, I just feel truly blessed to have been part of that. And if I never trained and had done what I'd done as a racing fan or nerd, as you might say, I'd be very happy. But did I feel pressure? Not really, but to do that, to be that person to start off at that le rate wouldn't, just uh, wouldn't suit me. Mm. You know, I'm a probably, I've always been told it's a marathon, not a sprint, and I'm very happy that it's now. But I, just, I, I wouldn't have had owners that wanted to do it like that either. I find you have a rapport with your owners, and you find that there's a way that you want to operate with horses. Um, and although no one likes to be too patient, um, it's just nice when it does come off and you've had a plan. Um, and I think were you to rush or change that plan, um, for the reasons, like you're saying, for pressure, I think that's when things just go wrong. Would you say that you're quite old school in that way? I know that you're you're not old school in, in necessarily the way you train, but do you think you're quite old school in your outlook, in your wish to be patient and to take your time and to develop close relationships with your owners and so forth? I hope so. Um, and I think that as long as we're all singing from the same hymn sheet, what we're trying to achieve with the horse, you know, with a horse, then we can all share disappointment if it doesn't work, and then we can all ser seriously celebrate when it does. Um, so I, I think so, but I've always maintained, and I remember Nikki saying, you know, it's about the relationship with the owners. Horses are ephemeral, they do come and go, but relationships need to last, and he's got a lot of long-lasting owners there, and that's a testament to his ability to find the horses and keep the relationship with the owners going, horses coming and going regardless. What was your time at Seven Barrows like? Again, it was amazing, uh, you know, well, I, I, never, I remember the interview like it was yesterday and I kind of have to badger Nikki after the interview saying, do you want me to come and work for you or not? So I, I never really got the job, I kind of just took it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, have, you have to explain that one. Well, I'd, I'd gone there, I'd, I'd spoken to James, I said, look, I'm going, and I just worked hit with him as a stable lad, I was quite a keen stable lad, but I was um, looking to, you know, uh, move on and learn more and I always thought if I could go to someone like Nikki um, I you know really could learn from someone who a bit like James in reverse you know trained jumpers and flat horses um, mm. um, and so the opportunity came for an interview and I remember driving down the M4 in pelting rain and it was the weekend of the uh, the lock-in stakes and of course Soviet Song was due to run in that and rain was not really her favorite thing so I reported to James on the pelting rain on the M4 and then got there and um, uh, you know, I was quite, I was 21, so I, Nikki was in the office and um, <clears throat> I thought it was a Friday night, actually, and it was evening racing and Jack the Giant was running. And I rang ahead, Jack the Giant was running in a handicap hurdle at Aintree, and I rang ahead thinking, God, Nikki probably won't, he probably be racing. And then I arrived, he was like, Friday night at Aintree. No, I'm here, to the, I remembered you're coming. I was like, good, so I had the interview, and I, you, at the end it wasn't like start on this date, it was just, thanks for coming, we'll speak soon. And then after the July sales, which is when I said to James, I would go, I was still waiting for this <laughs> phone call. So I just sort of rang going, I'm starting this time. And I and started... Said, okay, old boy. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, and I'd never really been to the yard, because I just went straight into the office and had the interview, never met Corky or anybody like that, you know, because you're... It's such an, uh, you know, an institution there, Seven Barrows, with how many people they've got there, the horses, the staff, like Corky himself, who've been there for years. So it was just you know, in awe of it, really, because it's so much history involved, really. And how did you, how did you and Nicky get on personally? Uh, well, I think, I, I, speaking for myself, I think, he might not say the same, but I, 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 I loved it. I kind of ended up being um, 
someone who really, well, I, probably a real try hard. You know, I wanted to make sure we got everything as you know, neat as we could and, and got things right. I mean, he has a tremendous work ethic, so you're having to keep up with him a lot. But that's always quite good to learn how to do that. Um, yeah, he lives life in fast forward, really. Um, so, and learning and listening from the people around him, like Corky um, and Rowey, the secretary there at the time, Rowey Reese Jones. You know, you learn from people like that how to operate and do things and get things done in the right way. Why has he trained so many winners? Um, because he's very competitive. He's a comp competitor and he loves it. You know, he he's someone who works. 20, literally 24-7. You don't find him sitting on the sofa in an afternoon ever. Um, and <clears throat> it's always about that next horse. You know, he's very, and, he, and you know, he's, again, he's, he's a, a tremendous competitor, as I say, that's what he loves doing. And, you know, obviously he's, he's had some great horses, but in 2006, we would have had a few, but then in 2007, suddenly the recession hit and the numbers really increased. Um, amazingly, it was extraordinary, and these horses appeared at the time in about 2006. The best horse we had probably would have been Fonmore, who was a tremendous horse. But then the ante was seriously upped. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you look now. If if you had Fonmore in the yard now, he'd be the ninth best horse in the stable, wouldn't he? Absolutely. I mean, and he was a fabulous horse. He sadly got injured in preparation for the Paddy Power that year, but. Um, yeah, it was amazing. Barbershop was potentially the best horse we had. He'd won a bumper and then was going hurdling. And, um, and then it just all just got bigger and better in terms of quality. Um, and, you know, the arrival of horses, I mean, like binoculars and I suppose long runs later. But, you know, with, with that year we had, I think, Jack the Giant was third in the Arkle and we had hardly many horses like running in the champion hurdle. It yeah. was just so strange and suddenly it all hit like we had binocular ramp and Jarby. Um, and then obviously the two mile chases hit like Finian's Rainbow and um, a certain Sprinter Sacra. And then obviously the three mile brigade arrived which was long run and Bobsworth coming through um, behind him. Mm. And, then, and then it was time for you to take the plunge. Now, have you always had the confidence that you know, this, was a, this was a sustainable way of life? That yeah, you were going to train and this is something you could do for the foreseeable future? Or have there been moments along the way in the last few years where you've thought, oh, this, is, this isn't going to work? I think you all have doubt, but it kind of drives you a bit, a bit, a lot. Failure drives me, you know, you kind of want to just keep trying to plug away at thinking you're doing the right thing, not changing too much along the way either, because I think if you change too much, you never know what the difference is made, has it, if it makes so a difference you've always had the belief in your own ability? Uh, in our inability of what we are doing, yes, uh, sort of our yard ethos and what you know the yard philosophy of what we are about and how the horses are. Because I think if you go into certain yards, the way the horses are is a kind of slightly wishy-washy phrase, but it does. You know, you want them to be. You know, you can look at a television screen and watch the racing and going, that's that person trains that because you can just tell how. You know, you, you know, you can see a Venetia Williams horse a mile off on telly. I think uh, I follow them a lot, um, and Nicky Henderson obviously the same. So. Uh, no, but I, I, I would always think about the next thing. I'm not ever going to dwell on things too much because I think that's wrong. And that's something that I definitely learned from Nikki. You know, you have disasters in the mornings on the gallops or at night, whenever, and then you just, second lot, you move on. And, and it, you sort of t touched upon that sort of hare and tortoise analogy, really, <clears throat> and the fact that you want to build your house on a, on a solid foundation. Mm. Does it feel this season now that you're rapidly closing in on already passing your best ever total and we've had a truncated season and... Yeah, the horses have been running so well, the strike rate's great, you've won all these graded races with, with Song for Someone and Land and Abo Lad. Do you feel now, right, we're, we're in the right place? We've just kicked into the, into, the next, into the next stage of our enterprise? Yeah, because they are just by their... I mean, we, we are, like, we always say, you're merely the curator of these horses. They are what they are. I mean, they're just good, aren't they, really? So... Yes, because I, 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 I kind of always think that the horses should do the talking and they go out there and do their thing. You're quite, and, and you're, but you're quite good at talking. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, but I, don't, I just want to watch and have a view of what I think mm. should happen. So, like last year, Song of Someone, we had, he only ran four times. Um, I th thought he would win at Fontwell and he ran off 136 that day, which now was like a, and he was like 12 to 1 or something. I'm not, I don't bet ever. I'm just not a gambler by my nature. 
I like in my head to think what I expect. Because, you know, when you have runners, a lot of people will take you going, good luck with all these, uh, hopefully they'll all win or something. And you're like, well, they don't always have to win. As long as they come back okay and we have another day and we've learned something, I actually don't mind so much. And that's why we, you know, we use a lot of like Ben Post, because I learn a lot from him. He tells me a lot about how to get, because it's easy with the better ones, but you need a lot of sort of that inside info on how to get the lesser ones over the winning line. Um, so I, I just feel that we, we want to try and keep going and learning about the horses as they go along and therefore you can place them right. So with Landon Abo Lad, for example, he won a novice hurdle and I just thought, well, he did that off not loads of training and hadn't run for nearly a year. So surely he's probably above average, I hope. And so when he ran, we ran him in the, we were going to run him in the introductory hurdle, which actually was won by Harry Fry's horse, Metier. Um, and we ran him the next day at Haydock. In the grade two. Uh, listed. Listed, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I said to Richard Johnson, who rode him that day, I said, look, if he falls flat on his face here, then fine. And we will go back to a novice hurdle under penalty. If he doesn't, I've got an idea of what we might do next. Um, and he did the latter, which was brilliant. I mean, you know, Richard said he felt like he did it fairly, he's a, he falls asleep a bit in races, but he does well at the end, which is most important. Just tell me why, why yesterday meant more perhaps than, than any other day with Song for Someone. Because I was just saying, we don't run many horses at Cheltenham. At Cheltenham, as we've already heard about, um, has a certain resonance. You know, it's, it's not just, they're not race, just races, it's the home of our sport. And obviously, having worked with someone like Mr. Henderson, as you know, Cheltenham is fairly important, not the literary festival, the festival in March. Um, and so I, you know, it, and we haven't ever avoided it with him for, because it's Cheltenham. It's just because it's so competitive there, no matter when you're there, it's always competitive. And Lady Gibbings was very much like, you know, the horse will go where he presents himself to go, not us trying to make him go where he shouldn't. Um, and that's why it was really lovely to see him finish the way he did because I've always thought that hill would really suit him especially over two miles because he just keeps going um, and I remember when Aidan rode him in the juvenile hurdle at Aintree it wasn't ideal in terms of how the race played out but he said I can tell you when the chips were down the horse just still wanted to keep going and he said that is something very few horses have which you could see yesterday and that is, uh, is what it meant to you. A little bit of disbelief, a lot of emotion. Uh, there's Neil, Nicky's right-hand yeah. man, driver. Ever youthful, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, it, it, it was lovely, I, it was, it's, it's fabulous because, you know, when I talk about what we're trying to achieve with horses, Sir Peter and Lady Gibbings totally understand what we are trying to do. You know, every year, for a while, we bought a horse in France, and the remit is to win a race. Mm. Doesn't, they're not going, we bought this horse for this, let's go to Cheltenham. They go, just win somewhere. So, of course, we took Song with Someone to Ludlow and got beaten, took him to Fakenham and got stuffed. And then I said, look, I really feel we should try him at Newbury. She was like, don't be ridiculous, darling. I mean, if he can't win, he's not. But anyway, I said, I think he can rock and roll around there because he just couldn't get an even keel around the sort of smaller, tighter tracks. Um, and he went flat out around Newby and I think one by 20 lengths and, um, and just went dead arrow straight up the home straight in Newbury and you know, you, the horses do that or they don't. And he just, and he galloped, and he, uh, that's why yesterday it was disbelief because I thought the horse could win on his ability. But when they took the hurdles out, I was really concerned because he's, as I say, he is not the fastest horse, um, but he's game as a pebble as you could see. And time is time is running out, sadly. But um, is he okay this morning? I, I suppose you probably got up before he did. Uh, he's fine. I've had calls that he's Good. fine, and um, yeah, we'll think on what to do next. But we'll live on um, yesterday a bit longer. Yeah, quite right. I mean, the the races are there. You know what they are. So I guess it's just a question of when he when he tells you he wants to run in one. Absolutely, and what the handicapper makes him. Because I mean, he'd be up there with some of the better hurdlers in the country now, I suppose, bar a certain mayor of Mr. Henderson McManus's. You know, and it's a, you just don't know what's going to happen between now and Cheltenham, so... No, and as um, Lady Gimmings would say, we'll keep it in the day. Absolutely. Well, Tom, thanks so much for, for chatting to me. Uh, have you got a busy week ahead, busy Christmas ahead? 
Uh, fairly busy. We've got a couple of entries next week. Not lots, actually, so quite a, so quite a week, maybe towards the weekend. Ask it. We might have a couple if the rain keeps coming. And given that this is a 26% strike rate you're oper operating at at the moment, which is just about the best in the country, um, what's a, a nice bet for, for the monks this week? How are the monks going to get the... Uh... Like, owner's already saying to me, when we run our horse, we feel pressure to keep up the good work. And I'm like, don't feel pressure ever, but... Um, well, Landon Lad might run in the kennel gate at Ascot, so well, hopefully if it keeps raining, he might go there or he might wait for the Tollworth. Hopefully they're all tuning in this morning. Tom Simmons, who's been my guest today, thank you very much. Our final show before Christmas will take place a week from now. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.